Well, good morning, New City Church and family and all our friends. We welcome you this Sunday morning. We're so glad that you're joining us uh, on this day. It's the last Sunday of January. Can you believe that January 2021 is now ending today? Well, we're looking forward to a great service of worship. And the song is starting off with freedom. And the Bible says, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And I trust that you are going to get liberated this morning. You're going to have some elbow room and you're going to praise the Lord with our team. And you're going to prepare your hearts to hear the Word of God. So clear away all the clutter. Focus with your friends and family in your room. And let's bless the Lord. So Linda, why don't you open us in a word of prayer? Hallelujah. 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 We worship you, O oh God. Yes. You are God. There is no other. So God, we look to you this morning, God, to receive from your hand. We are all fed by your hand, by your word, Father God. So we thank you. It was for freedom that you set us free, that we would no longer be bound with anything, that every bit of weight that we have carried or are carrying now would be set free, would be loosed from us, oh God. So God, I thank you, Father. I thank you for our time together, for those that are watching father god wherever they might be that they might receive that their hearts might be open to receive from you god we thank you that you formed our hearts god and you formed that that you might sit on the throne of our hearts, Father God. So whatever it is, Lord Jesus, that is holding us down or keeping us bound, today would be the day, today would be the day yes. that we would be set free yes. in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, after that prayer, I'm sure you're ready now to sing and praise God and worship the Lord. So let's go right into that now. Good morning, New City. Are you guys excited to be here? Come on. We're going to shout freedom in this place. Are you ready? Come on. Clap, 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 clap. Oh, 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 yeah. Woo! I want to clap a little louder than before. Shout out it louder than 
You have won the victory. Oh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have won the victory. up to God. Come and thank him for the victory that has been won on the cross of Calvary for your sake, your sin, your sickness, your depression, that mental illness. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. You have won the victory.
New City Church viewers. We're here for that time of the service for our offering and also our weekly announcements. I want to give you a short testimony. Back in the early 90s, I was newly saved and I told my mother I had given my life to the Lord and she said to me, are you tithing? I said, uh, yeah. She said, 10%? And I said, well, not exactly. But I went home and I, I thought about it and um, I decided that I was going to start tithing. Now, I had a lot of bills. I had two mortgages and I had a car payment. It was about $2,000 a month that I was laying out. And the, the, the tithe that I was giving or the offering that I was giving was definitely not 10%. That I know for sure. But I said to myself, I'm going to start doing this. And I remember writing the first check. And really with much trepidation, I wrote that check. But I continued to do it every month. And so I had these three uh, big bills, $2,000 a month. And through a set of circumstances, I was able to consolidate those three items and wound up saving $800 a month. So that's my testimony to what God can do when you give to him and to his church because that's who you're really giving it to you're really giving it to God you don't have to worry about anything else you know you're giving it to God so let's pray for this offering um, right now so father we do give you thanks and praise for your goodness your goodness is always in our lives your goodness flows over us father God and we thank you for a heart of generosity that you give us because you are a generous God so father we give you thanks and praise in Jesus name Amen. So here's how you can get your offerings and your tithes to New City Church. You can give on New City Church Giving. It's called newcitygiving at gmail.com. Or you can mail it in. You can drop it in our new mailbox. That's on the side of the building. Or if you call us or email us, we can arrange for a pickup. So our announcements for this week are 7 p.m. tonight, evangelist Philip Drummond. He's an evangelist, it's quite good, and he'll be speaking tonight at 7 p.m. That will be on Zoom. Also, from Tuesday to Friday, as always, we have our 10 a.m. Zoom meetings. This consists of a teaching, uh, and there is prayer involved, and it's quite good. And if you haven't been on Zoom at all, or you don't, you're, uh, don't know how to get on, please contact us, and we can definitely set you up on Zoom. I have enjoyed it so much over these past months that um, I know that if you're not doing it, you would want to do it. So just contact us, and we'll help you out with that. Also, on Wednesday night, Pastor Bombay has started a series called God in Nomics. And it's been quite good. He did two, two parts so far, and he's going to continue that. And that will be on YouTube at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. So I hope you partake of all of that so we can connect with one another and you can feel part of what's going on here at New City Church. God bless you. It's Liz Kaufman, and here's two of my kids, Bianca and Nick, and we're fairly new to New City Church, and we're just going to share with you how it's been for us during the pandemic and lockdown. So Bianca, how has it been for you during the lockdown pandemic? It was very scary, and um, I don't like how the school got locked down. Okay. And are you going to school right now? No, because it's in a lockdown, so we're doing homeschooling. 
And do you miss your friends at school? Yeah, I miss my friends. Do you want to share anything else that you like or don't like about the lockdown? I like um, doing a ballet class. But are you doing ballet right now? No, because it's a lockdown. Right, you missed your recital, right? How about you, Nick? How has it been for you during the lockdown? It's been a little bit different. Is there something that you like or don't like about it? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you miss any of your friends from school? No. <laughs> okay. How do you like homeschooling? It's easy. Oh, okay. I guess I need to make it a little bit harder for you. Okay, well, there you have it. That's how it's been for us um, during the lockdown. They've been homeschooling and missing their friends. Okay, and Bianca, how has the Lord been helping you during this time? Is there a verse you want to share? Joy of the Lord is my strength. Okay, so the joy of the Lord is your strength. Very good. I think I remember the pastor saying that verse one Sunday morning. Very good. And you, Nick, how has the Lord been helping you? Have you been praying? But we pray together sometimes, right? Okay. And we've, yeah, we pray together. We read the Bible together, right? And he helps us in hard times, doesn't he? He's always with us, right? Nick, is the Lord always with you? Yes. Awesome. Great job, guys.
your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail. I won't carry what I'm not ordained to carry. You know, if there's no anointing on what I'm carrying, I shouldn't be carrying it. There is a covering over these, those who are not yet saved in your house, because the Lord is watching your house, that all would be in the ship, all would be in the ark of God, and all would be saved. Well, it's time for the Word, and I trust you have your Bibles with you. First, I want to thank the team for leading us in worship this morning, and uh, Linda for doing our offering and announcements, and, and I want to thank those in the background who are working diligently to keep this happening, and thank you for praying and standing with us together so that we can keep the ministry of New City alive and well to the ends of the earth, but particularly in our city. So are you ready for the Word? Well, I'm turning to Luke 23, and the scene is Jesus is on the cross. Now, many of us know the seven last statements of Christ, but I want to deal with the first statement, and it's actually a prayer. And this prayer is so powerful that you and I need to live it daily so that we can walk in the unlocked presence and power of God. And I think you know what it is. It is a prayer that Jesus said, Father... Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, I think we know they knew what they were doing, yet they didn't know. But the first three words, Father, forgive them. You know, when Jesus said that, the Bible says that God rent the heavens and God came out because of that powerful declaration, Father, forgive forgive them and so heavenly father we pray right now that your word will go forth in might and in diligence to captivate our heart and to change our attitudes and spirit in christ's name amen you know when narvez the spanish patriot lay dying his father came to hear his last confession and he asked him whether he had forgiven all his enemies and Narvez looked astonished and said, Father, I have no enemies. I have shot them all. <laughs> well, you know, that's just like human nature. We want to dispose of them. We want to rid of our enemies. But, you know, Jesus taught us something very powerful in the Scriptures. Jesus prayed. The very opening statement on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. And the curtains were rent in two, and the Lord God came out to humanity to minister life to them. Now think of it, just for a moment. When I look at the genealogy of Luke, 
And I see that here in, in chapter 3, about 20, chap, uh, 20 chapters before, we find the genealogy. And here we start with the genealogy of Jesus himself when he began his ministry at 30 years old. And it says that he's the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Matthai. And it goes all the way back to Adam. And when it comes to Adam, he says, Adam, he is the son of Adam. And then he says about Adam that Adam is the son of God. Wow. I don't know if he caught that. But the blood of Jesus and the forgiveness of Jesus ran right from Jesus right down to Adam. Not the son of a sinner, the son of a man who transgressed, but the son of God. And this is so powerful that forgiveness through Christ washes the bloodline through every son right into the beginning of time and restored Adam to be the original firstborn son of God as a human being on the earth. And this is so powerful because this is what Jesus did. And this is the power of forgiveness. It cleanses every man and it cleanses our genealogy. It cleanses us with the blood and it restores all of us to son status. So Jesus said, when you stand praying, forgive. You know, sometimes we have these secret compartments in our hearts. And, you know, we want to dig out the trash because in our hearts we hold stuff against people. And when we hold stuff against people and then we dig out that trash in our secret life or in our secret complaint compartment, you know, God is holding back the blessing. God is withholding. So if you haven't sense the presence of God for a long time or you haven't experienced the windows of heaven opening up and you haven't tasted of his richness and of his blessing then I'm going to ask you to check your heart are you holding anything in your heart against somebody else are you repeating stuff are you replaying stuff is there trash in your heart that you just bring out and there are so many scriptures that really minister to us in this light. And I'm going to take you to Genesis chapter 45. Here is the scene. We're looking at Joseph. And you know, Joseph's brothers have come together. It is a famine that has, has driven them to them. So there is something good that come, can come out of famine. That's just a side point. And you know, when we're looking at Joseph in chapter 45, he says, Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him and he cried out make everyone go out from me and no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brethren now here is a scene they're all united together and the scripture says Joseph could not contain himself and it says he wept out loud and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it Wow, that must have been a pretty loud cry that just was pent up within him. And he cried out. The cry wasn't, why did you do this? The cry wasn't, I hate you. The cry wasn't, uh, you know, you mistreated me. That's not what his cry was. And even the house of Pharaoh that heard it, Joseph said to his brothers, listen to me. He said, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. I believe they were just shocked to know that here they're standing before a brother that they had uh, sold into Egypt, probably long thought he was dead and buried, but now he's standing before them as the prince of Egypt, second in command. And Joseph says to his brothers, please come near to me. Now, you know, if Joseph had hatred or bitterness towards his brother, he would not have asked them to come close to him. But yet he draws them close to him. And he says, and they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Wow. He said, God sent me here ahead to preserve life. That means forgiveness preserves 
life. And because Joseph was a man who learned to forgive, he was actually acting as God in forgiving. Now let's read two more verses. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth to save your lives by a great deliverance. Think of it. In this time of famine, in this time of hardship, God has raised up Joseph, and there is the spirit of Joseph, which is the spirit of Jesus that is in all of us. He forgave his brothers, and forgiveness unlocked a blessing not only to Joseph, but towards his brothers. He said, don't be angry. Don't be grieved. It was God who sent me ahead. Yes, he used your hands. He used your hearts of jealousy and betrayal, but in the end, it was God who was working on all things together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. I find this very, very enriching to hear that God has used him. Now, you know, if some of us were Joseph, what would we, what would we do with the next thing? And second in command, remember the man in Matthew 18, whom the king forgave 10,000 talents. And he turned around after receiving such a pardon of multiplied millions of dollars, maybe 30 million plus. He goes around, finds a man who owes him 100 denarii. And what does he do? He chokes him. He grabs him. Pay me what you owe. And when the king hears about it, the king pulls him in. But you see, Joseph didn't act like that, did he? Joseph forgave. Joseph had a God attitude. And you know, if you and I were there, we might have pulled Potiphar up. And said, Potiphar, it was your wife. You know, your wife is the adulterous eyes, not me. And he might have, you know, given it to him and, and said, throw her away in the prison cell. But we hear no record in the Bible of him even calling up Potiphar and his wife that got him arrested, falsely accused of adultery, and thrown into prison again for a few years. But we hear none of that. Why? Because Joseph learned to forgive. And I'm going to ask you, are you a person that learns to forgive? Are you a person that learns to let it go? You see, forgiveness is not an act. You see, forgiveness is an attitude. That's what forgiveness is because an act can change. But an attitude is your spirit. An attitude is what you live. An attitude is how we act daily and how we want to cultivate that attitude. And that's what we want. Now, I want to turn back to Luke. And when we look at the, uh, in the Bible, in the book of Luke, you know, chapter 15, what do we find? We find three lost things. And one of those was a wayward son called the prodigal. This wayward son basically had wished his father dead. He left home with a fortune. And when finally all the fortune was gone, he came to his senses. What did he say? He said, I will go back to my father. Notice he didn't say, I will go back to my father's house. Do you know why he didn't say, I'll go back to my father's house? Because he knew that there are people in his father's house who just wouldn't forgive him. But he knew that his father would forgive him. And we know that. And his father did forgive him. And the father loved him. But what about the house? What about the brothers of the house? What about the sisters of the house? And what about the church today? What about your house? What about the family of God today? You know, we know from the great story that when he comes back, he comes back to the Father. You see, God can forgive us, but our fellow man can't forgive us. Our fellow brothers and sisters won't forgive us. Oh, it's like that story. You know, there's somebody we... Oh, I can't forgive him. I can't forgive him for all that he's done to me, Pastor. You don't know what he's done to me. I won't forgive him. That's it. It's not that you can't. You just said it. You won't. It's a matter of the will. When you say you can't or you won't, you're saying it's a matter of your will that you don't want to let go of the offense. Let's go back to the story of the prodigal son. So when we're looking at the son, what does he say? He's back in the house, and we find out they're throwing up a fatted calf for him, and, and they're putting on the best robe. And, and what do we find? After we find that, you know, everybody's in the house rejoicing except for the bigger brother. And the father says, but to him, and he called them. He said, your brother has come because we received him safe and sound. And your father has killed a fatted calf. Verse 28. But he was angry and he would not go in. Think of it. 
The bringer brother says he was angry. He wouldn't go in. Therefore, his father came out and he pleaded with him. Imagine the older brother was holding this resentment and it mounted to anger. And he would not go inside because his brother who was lost had now come home. And the father pleaded with him. But in the end, it doesn't tell us, does it? Verse 32, he says, It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. That's the main story. Your brother was dead. He's alive again. Yes, he squandered. But the main thing is his soul is right with God. Beloved, we don't know if that brother forgave. Maybe for a good reason. Because that is the power of choice. That is the power of the will. Now, it is up to us. We can be that brother who doesn't forgive the other. Or we can be the brother or the sister that does forgive. The choice is in your hand. And I tell you, you're going to be judged as you judge. How are you going to receive forgiveness if you don't show mercy? If you need mercy, then you've got to give mercy. If you need forgiveness, then you need to give forgiveness. And if you don't want to be judged, then get out of the judgment seat. Because the Bible says in Matthew 5 and 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. And that is why sometimes people can get forgiveness from God like that, that prodigal. He said, I will arise and go to my father. You see? We've got to say, I will arise and not only go to my father, but I will go to my father's house. I'll be welcome back in the church. I'll be welcome back in the family. I'll be welcome back in the community. You see, we need to get out of the judgment seat because the Bible says mercy triumphs over judgment. Be angry, but don't sin. As Jesus forgave us on the cross, as he forgave a thief, who had violated him at least three, if not four, commandments. Think of it. Those thieves on the, on the left and the right of him, Jesus forgave them because he said, Father, forgive them. And when he said that, that opened the door for the next command. And he said, he, he said to that man when he asked him to remember him, and Jesus said, Today you will be with me in paradise. You know, he said it to a thief. Who had broke three commands. What commands? He did not love his neighbor. That's why he stole. Thou shalt not steal. Number two, thou shalt not covet. And number four, coveting flows out of even idolatry. Because you want something. You idolize something far greater. And yet the thief was forgiven of the violation of four out of ten commands on that cross. And Jesus said, this day you will be with me in paradise. Luke 23 43 and we can't find forgiveness listen beloved we need to be brethren we need to be in unity because that's what unlocks the blessing of god oh no no i can't fellowship with that brother he's he he's he's not he's liberal he's red and i'm blue he's on the left and i'm on the right listen jesus didn't die on the left and he didn't even die on the right Jesus died in the center and sometimes that's the hardest place to be is in the center because he was a mediator listen that's what we are we are mediators we stand between heaven and hell for the souls of men and we are here to be ambassadors to dispense the forgiveness of God you see you know a woman said at the altar she said she was weeping and her husband had left her with lots of kids And here she was weeping and and the pastor and the elders came and they prayed with her. And she, she cried out. She said, he doesn't deserve it. He doesn't deserve forgiveness when they asked her to forgive. But they said, honey, dear, you deserve it. Even if he doesn't deserve it, you deserve it. Because unless you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will not forgive you your trespasses. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Let me read it for you. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father 
forgive you your trespasses. Wow. How many of us today are locked? How many of us today are bound? How many of us don't even sense the nearness of God? Maybe we need to let it go. What did Jesus teach in another portion of Luke chapter 11 verse 14? He said, forgive us our sins. For we forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Everyone who is indebted to us. You know what that word debt means? That word debt means that they owe you something. Somebody owes you something. Maybe they failed to make it. They, maybe they failed to deliver on something. You got to let it go. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, love keeps no record of wrong, no record of ill. Got to let it go. Love covers a multitude. Do you want healing? Healing and forgiveness are tied together. The Bible says in, in James 5.16, confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. You see, healing is and forgiveness are tied together. When we confess trespasses and we pray for forgiveness, the Bible says we will be healed. And that's when the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Beloved, it's because Jesus says, Father, forgive them, that God was liberty, at liberty to come out of the Holy of Holies and now come and move and live amongst us and walk amongst us and heal us and deliver us. That prayer that Jesus prayed, he prayed three prayers on that cross. You know, he, he forgave that, that criminal on the cross. And then he united. He, Jesus said to his mother, woman, this is your son. And he said to the disciple, John, this is your mother. You see, forgiveness brings the single mother, the orphan, together brings reconciliation. Forgiveness is an attitude. If you want to see revival, if you want to see a breakthrough in your family, then you're going to learn how to forgive. Why is it that in those suppressed nations like Iran and Ethiopia, China, Sudan, Egypt, and many more, they're under the heavy hand of government, heavy hand of, of these raiders and, and, and other religions, but yet they're experiencing the greatest revival. Not only do they pray fervently, but what else do they do? Every one of those places, you know, they've learned to forgive their oppressors. In Africa, you know, these militia soldiers, they've walked in. I've heard story after story in Sudan, in Ethiopia. Their people of God are worshiping. And these militant, you know, guys would come in, interrupt the service. And while a woman is nursing her own baby, they'll grab that baby. And then they'll take that baby and rip her away from her mother's breast and, and cast it out the window. And that baby will land somewhere far in some rocky, dirty soil. And only to find when they go chasing out and they find that baby, baby has no heartbeat and is dead on arrival. How do you think they survive? These mothers and their fathers, they have learned to forgive and let go. You see, the Bible says, whoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. When you bind somebody with unforgiveness, when you bind somebody in hate, then you're bound. But when you loose them, they're loosed. And I believe this is one of the reasons why this mistreated, abused, harassed, beaten, jailed, separated from families, raped, oftentimes are experiencing the greatest revivals that earth is heaven, ha has ever witnessed is because they have learned to forgive their oppressors. I read another story on the Lord's Day. A group of missionaries and believers in New Guinea had gathered together to observe the Lord's Sabbath. And after one young man sat down, a missionary recognized that sudden tremors came on him. He passed through the young man's body and he indicated that he was at a great nervous strain over him. Then in a moment, he was all quiet again. The missionary whispered, What is it that is troubling you, my son? He said, Ah. Oh, he said, the man who just walked in killed and ate the body of my father. And now he has come in to remember the Lord with us. At first, I didn't know whether I could endure it, but it is all right now. He is washed in the same precious blood of Jesus. 
as I am. So together he forgave, and together they broke bread and had communion. It is a marvelous thing the work of the Holy Spirit does. Does the world know anything like this? Does the world know the power of forgiveness? You see, where there is forgiveness, there is revival. Where there is forgiveness, there is blessing. Where there is forgiveness, there is an open heaven. Where there is forgiveness, the power of God is not stopped or hindered. The power of God is flowing in that home, flowing in that community, flowing in that church. But the reason why we're still unfruitful is because when we stand in the place of prayer, we don't forgive our abusers. Is it any wonder? In China, they say that over 25,000 people are being baptized every day. And when some of these evangelists go overseas into Africa and into these places, they see tens and thousands of people get baptized and filled with the Spirit and get converted. Why? Because these people have learned that they have to learn to forgive their oppressors and be freed from hate, free from bitterness, or they will be locked up themselves. You know, in North America, rarely, rarely do I meet somebody that will tell me that they're full of bitterness or hate. I'm not mad. You ever heard that? I'm not mad. I'm not upset. But, you know, just by their tone and tenor, you know they are. You know, while we may preach the joy of the Lord, I want to tell you, the church is not an entertainment center. We focus on eternity. We focus on liberating soul. This is not the golden arches. This is the cross. And this is the pillar and ground of truth in the community. And you know, we need this today. We don't just need entertainment. We need the preaching of eternity to unlock your soul, to live in freedom so that you will walk away free. One of the greatest things Satan fears is a people who live and dispense forgiveness. Because forgiveness literally split the gates of hell wide open. And Jesus, the Bible says in Colossians, made a public spectacle of him because Jesus openly disarmed him and made a show of him because he forgave us. I was reading that account in Luke 23, you know, twice. First, the religious leaders, if he is the son of God, let him Come down from that cross. Let him prove it that he's the son of God. Then the, then the soldiers mocked him and did the same thing. They said, oh, let him. You know what? He left himself bound on that cross so that he could free us. This is what it's about. I want to challenge you today to live a life of freedom. I could go on. I'll talk some more maybe another time. Sometimes we say, well, I'm not going to forgive until he or she asks me for forgiveness. Until they come and, and, and repent and ask me, hey, Jesus, hung on that cross. I don't see nobody at the, the foot of the cross. I didn't see Sanhedrin. I didn't see the Pharisees at the foot of the cross. I, I didn't see anybody come and asking him for forgiveness. And yet the first thing he uttered from that cross when there was nobody at the altar around the cross saying for Jesus, forgive me. I was wrong. He's not even Judas. But what did Jesus do? He said it before they even came. Father, forgive them. Forgive them. You see, it should not be contingent. If you want to be free, then you need to release with the same power that Jesus has released you. Let's pray. Let's close our eyes. Let's bow our heads. Let's ask God, who do I need to release? We sang about freedom. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Are you free today? If you received the pardon, the forgiveness of God, then you need to forgive. And now talk about it. Lord Jesus, we ask you to stretch out your loving arms again today. On this last Sunday of January, let people not be locked up anymore. Let homes not be locked up anymore. Let hearts not be locked up anymore. 
Let there not be a ceiling above the blessing of God over our heads. But let us release people who have hurt us, offended us, damaged us. Let us leave the judgment to God. Let us forgive them so that you can act in redeeming them. Father, we pray for the power of God right now. The power of forgiveness. The power that comes when we say it, when we release somebody. Oh, the joy that filled my soul. And right now we're praying that every soul listening in earshot of this message will come into liberty. The liberty of the cross. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I trust you prayed that prayer. I trust that you will walk in that prayer. I trust that that will be your framework and your attitude day by day. Hey, listen. It's a real world. And so hurt is real. But bitterness is a reaction. Getting hurt, getting offended is a real thing. But let's not manifest the works of darkness. Don't react, but live in freedom. And you will be a new person in Christ. If we can help you, write to us, email us, or give us a call. The information will be on your screen. We're so glad you joined us. Next week we'll have communion together. The Lord bless you. And have a wonderful rest of your day. And join us tonight on Zoom. Amen. Well, we've come to the end of our service this morning, and we're so glad that you joined us. We pray that some aspect of the service today has blessed you, and that you're taking home a blessing. Well, you are home, and you're taking with you a blessing from the Lord. And uh, it was so good to have my friends Bianca and Nick with us today. Did you enjoy it? Yes. You did really well. And uh, we're just going to say goodbye to everybody in a second. But uh, we want you to join us tonight on Zoom with Evangelist Philippe Drummond from out west. He'll be sharing uh, his heart with us tonight. And the rest of the week we have Zoom and services. So keep connected. Contact us if we can serve you in any way. We're praying for you. And we're praying that the doors of the church will open again shortly. So agree with us that we'll be back in the house worshiping the Lord together. Now, kids, are you ready? We're going to wave. Have a good Sunday, okay? So you say it. Bye. Have a good Sunday. Bye. Have a good Sunday. All right. God bless you all.